Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Let's start. So, we are talking about the rational expectation model and we have understood some basic ideas about and we were discussing the, the basic framework of the equations uh, that we are going to solve. So, the reference of this particular session remains same Benja Hadra chapter 5 and these things we have already explained. So, let us not get back to these things and now we were discussing here. So, we were talking about the new classical argument that how uh, certain frameworks that were used at that time by the Keynesian and New Keynesian school of thought, how this was not very well accepted and later it was uh, challenged also. So, here we have three set of equations. So, here y t, it is dependent upon the deviations actual minus the expected. So, this is the objective that we have expectation. So, here we have the uh, p t which is actual. So, deviation of this it is measured by the alpha 1 and here you have the error term and this p t minus uh, if p t is greater than expectation of t minus 1 it means that people are not able to predict about the future and if you have a p t less than expectation of t minus 1 this all has to deal with the labor supply in the economy. So, here you have uh, and once you have labor supply then it also creates more output in the economy and that helps a lot. Here you have y t is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1 m t minus p t plus beta 2 expectation of t minus 1 p t plus 1 minus p t plus uh, v t th this is what we have. So, if I am saying here we have y t, so this is the, the money supply minus the price that you have the current price and here you have the role of expectation. So, this is linked with the how the price changes also augments in investment in the economy that in turn further creates the uh, growth scenarios for the economy. So, it mentions about here it mentions about the real balance effect. Now, here you have the money supply. So, m t is equal to mu 0 plus mu 1 m t minus 1 plus mu 2 y t minus 1 plus e t. So, here also we are introducing. Now, unlike the previous example where we had only the aggregate supply having the uh, error term in this setup we have a uh, all three equations having the error term and this makes the model really interesting. So, here you have a u t, here we have v t and then here you have the e t. All variables are in logarithms which means that if I am taking about g d p, so it is also in log. So, here all are the log models we you can say if you are having money supply it is not actually in thousands, it is the log of those thousands. So, you have to keep in mind. Aggregate supply curve a 1 is greater than 0 and here you have a u t, it is normally distributed with sigma square u, right. Stochastic short, uh, shock hitting the aggregate supply. So, as long as this is 0, this, this become deterministic, but the moment you add u t, it becomes stochastic. So, those things you have to add. A d is the aggregate shock demand curve and here we have beta 1 and beta 2 all greater than 0 and here you have error term again normally distributed stochastic hitting and then here you have the the expectation of inflation. So, this this is more like a, I have already mentioned the money supply rule that you have it is also having the error term E t and this is also having the n 0 sigma square e. Uh, here we are saying that u t and v t are not autocorrelate which means that v t expectation of v t comma v t minus 1 is equal to 0 and here u t u t minus 1 is equal to 0. So, that is what we uh, call the autocorrelation. The multicollinearity uh, system is different when the explanatory variables are correlated that we say. When your error term is correlated with the explanatory variables then we call it the term it will impact the variance. So, we deal with the heterocelastic case. Now, we are going to understand the rational expectation solution model. We are trying to understand that how we can think about some kind of macroeconomic stabilizer uh, kind of scenario, stabilization scenarios and how we can understand that whether the policy stance taken by the government or the central bank whether it is going to play a role in stabilizing the economy. 
here we are talking about the central bank because directly we are introducing the money supply here. So, here we have if we solve or go for the reduced form solution. So, here it looks like here you have a, when so we go for the aggregate demand aggregate supply equilibrium. So, here we have alpha 0 plus alpha 1 p t minus expectation of t minus 1 p t plus u t and then here you have again the. So, this is coming from the aggregate supply and this is uh, coming from the aggregate demand. So, th so, this is what we have beta 0 plus beta 1. Now, once I solve for p t, so this is the p t equation. Here you will be knowing that here we have a error terms of both aggregate demand and aggregate supply and divided by the coefficients of the aggregate demand and aggregate supply. This is what we have right beta 1. Now, in order to form the objective expectation, so let us work out. So, if we are going to think about the, the adjustment with price, so here we have. So, taking expectation both information set data t minus 1. So, we can think about the since we already have this scenario p t minus expectation of t minus 1 p t in the aggregate supply, let us find out first that. So, if you are having the expectation of t minus 1 p t, we introduce the expectation operator to this particular equation, this particular equation. So, it is bound that this particular term will be 0 and this particular term will be 0 because we have assumed that the mean is 0 and variance is constant. We are going to have the similar kind of scenario. Now, here we are also introducing that once we are going for expectation, then expectation of t minus 1 and here will be expectation of t minus 1. Expectation of t minus 1, expectation of t minus 1 p t is equal to expectation of t minus 1 p t. And expectation of t minus 1, expectation of t minus 1 p t plus 1 is equal to nothing but expectation of t minus 1 p t plus 1. So, this is how we have. And expectation of t minus 1 v t is equal to 0 and expectation of t minus 1 u t is equal to 0. So, how come this is linked? Once I bring this expectation operator inside, so once I am bringing this inside, then this is going to be 0. So, here it is once I go for uh, calculating this, then it becomes expectation of t minus p t this particular part, because all the error terms are 0 now. This is the actual price level that we had calculated. If I go for the subtraction, so p t minus expectation of t minus 1, if I subtract this from here, this then I have this particular expression, which is nothing but beta upon alpha 1 plus beta 1 m t minus expectation of t minus 1 m t plus here we have 1 upon alpha 1 plus beta 1 and here this is the error term difference. Now, these random term differences are having lot of meaning in macroeconomics because as long as you have the positive values coming or the differences then it will create problem in the model which means that it will deviate from the objective function. So, there you have the role. Price is higher than rationally expected if we have such type of thing that if v t is greater than expectation of t minus 1 v t and then here we have u t less than. So, these are the scenarios that gives if you even if you are not taking into account these things it may not matter much because it is clearly revealed here. Now, the deviation of m t minus expectation of t minus 1 m t will also matter because there also you have the stochastic term attached. So, let us understand the further solution of this. Since I have the expectation of t minus m t, so I can bring this the expectation of t minus m t to equation 3 of the money supply rule MSR. MSR is here. MSR is here that we have. So, I am introducing expectation of t minus 1 m t here. If I am introducing it here, then here you have the values introduced. So, here you have expectation of t minus 1 m t is equal to mu 0 plus mu 1 expectation of t minus 1 m t minus 1 plus mu 2 expectation of t minus 1 y t minus 1 plus expectation of t minus e t. Now, here we have mu 0 plus mu 1 m t minus 1 plus mu 2 y t minus 1. So, the actual money supply is nothing but this. This is what we have the in equation. Can I get this particular expression? I can get this particular expression here. So, here it becomes m t minus expectation of t minus 1 m t is equal to the error term which means that now I it this e t can be substituted back here. How does it look like? So, if I just go for the substitution of those things. So, here if I just go 6 into 7. So, if by substituting 6 and 7 into the aggregate supply. So, if I substitute 7, 
6 into your aggregate supply equation that we have here, right? Then how does it look like? So, here we can easily solve for it. We obtain the REA. So, once I go for substituting this, then we have y t is equal to alpha 0 plus alpha 1 b beta 1 e t plus alpha 1 v t plus beta 1 u u t upon alpha 1 plus beta 1. Now, you will be surprised to see that we have none of the variables of policy variables coming here. We have what? We have the error term of the money supply rule, not the money supply as such and then here we have v t and u t which means that even if the money supply is going to be increased by the central bank, it is not going to have a much impact on the y t because it is not coming explicitly or revealing explicitly into the final output equation. So, here what we say that the output does not depend on any of the policy variables that, that we had the mu i coefficient which are policy coefficient. So, the policy coefficients are this mu, uh, mu 1, mu 2, mu 0. So, these are this. So, once I have this then we cannot have the similar kind of expectation formed here. So, this is what we are. Hence, the policy maker cannot influence output in this model and this is a strong policy ineffectiveness. So, here what Lucas criticized the policy makers that you are formulating the policy, you have the long set of equations explaining the economy, but ultimately it is not helping you to get the ultimate objective because uh, you may be increasing the money supply, people will have different expectations, the random shocks will play a role which means that people are expecting, but also they have a some linkage uh, with uh, or some expectations about the other variables also they may be more relying on the information available in the US market about India than, than within India. So, in that kind of scenario even if you think about the, the money supply increase this is not going to change the output and rest of the variables may also uh, have a limited impact. So, if you understanding the macroeconomic picture. So, there is a literature called central bank commitment. So, commitment in the sense that uh, once you have the once you have the central bank commitment that it has to reduce the inflation by, by decreasing the money supply, then they will be acting. But at the same time the central bank credibility also matter. How credible is the central bank in managing the inflation? So, as long as you do not have any kind of policy variable impacting the output y t, then we do not see any kind of kind of impact here. Hence, the policy maker cannot influence output in this model and this is the strong policy ineffectiveness proposition. The Lucas in during 1970s, he criticized this idea. He said that uh, simple accepting uh, or going for policy formulation based on certain policy uh, parameters may not be sufficient. It is always good to have some kind of micro analysis and there you have the they started working on cert, certain types of uh, uh, general equilibrium kind of models. Here what it, it was uh, envisaged, so the Stanley Fisher, the Keynesian economist Stanley Fisher, he started understanding the role of this and Fisher introduced the idea that as long as you are having the understanding about the economy and you are working in an environment where the role of rigidity, so wage rigidity or price rigidity. So, there you have the, the, the understanding about uh, there it may happen that even if you go by such type of operations then the policy variable will appear in the equation. So, they had gone by some kind of one period contract and two period contract and they, they try to make that. Uh, policy ineffectiveness uh, proposition is invalid. So, under that they introduced the concept of what happens if the individual uh, is employed by the firm for only one period, what happens if the individual is employed for two periods where he is already knowing that this is going to be my wage in the next period. So, in that scenario policy ineffectiveness proposition becomes invalid and they also launched an attack on the neoclassical idea that the government intervention is not at all acceptable. This is the underlying idea behind 
the the I would say the rational expectation hypothesis. I hope this particular idea helped you to understand the model in a much better way. And we will be now moving towards the monetary economics part. We will be trying to understand the monetary models. But I hope uh, such type of a uh, basic analysis uh, um, has made you understand or your uh, or help you helps you understand the macroeconomic understanding uh, or macroeconomic concepts better. So, this is what we try to understand from this particular model. So, in a nutshell I would say that when you are trying to understand, when you are trying to formulate the model, you should always try to add some dimensions of the uh, uh, some dimensions of the micro where you will have the definitions of different agents operating in the economy and then you can think about adding understanding the efficiency inefficiency characteristics and finally with certain some calibrations you will be able to arrive at some kind of uh, scenarios based uh, analysis which will further give you the idea that whether a particular policy is impacting and then you can have the closed uh, view scenarios where you will be interacting one variable with another keeping all others constant. So, in recent literature when you read in macroeconomics then in most of the good journals then you will find that you will have a lot of people talking about the role of micro foundation. So, that is why I thought it is good to add a course on this topic and I hope it has helped you understand the, the idea of policy formulation in a much better way and where macroeconomists uh, commit mistake and where they have the scope of expanding the learning by adding the behavioral aspect. So, I will be stopping this topic here and I will be starting the new topic and new topic will be based on the monetary intertemporal model. So, monetary intertemporal model is important to understand. So, here we are going to talk about the micro foundations of uh, macroeconomics here from the perspective of intertemporal monetary models. Now, from the hardcore macroeconomics we are moving towards the, the area where you will have to understand the role of money in the economy. When you have a cash in your pocket and when you have a money in your pocket, what are the roles that you have uh, you can understand and what are the roles you can define of this money. So, we will have some brief idea and then we will move to explaining the model in a much better way. So, the book of Stephen D. Williamson remains same and Sanjay K. Chug and these two books are important to understand, but I would say that I am referring more of the Williamson here. So, here we have the objective, objective is that how can we think about the monetary and temporal model. Fisher relation which means that the real interest rate scenarios, how we can arrive the competitive equilibrium with the monetary intertemporal model. So, when I talk about monetary intertemporal model it helps you understand that given the two period scenario that you have, can you understand a situation or can you derive a situation where the individual is indifferent about using cash and credit, credit card. So, you have the credit card and credit card is having the beauty that it gives you a free uh, I would say interest free period and if you are not paying after the free interest period then you, uh, you will be penalized or you will be charged interest on the outstanding. So, credit card has become a new or alternative form of money where people are just having an arbitrage opportunity that whether they should be relying more on cash or card. So, under the competitive equilibrium we will try to understand that. Then you have the neutrality of money is one area where we focus more on monetary intertemporal model. How a shift in money demand affects the economic variables in the monetary intertemporal model. Then we talk about effectiveness of conventional and unconventional monetary policy that conventional when we have money supply increase or decrease, unconventional when we have a special packages or we have zero lower bound, liquidity trap all those kind of situations we will be examining. So, money is the medium of exchange we are we all know and in the medium of exchange when I talk about. So, here it has facilitated the transaction in a much better way. So, earlier when we had the barter system then there then we had the coincidence of of want. So, where you were if you want to sell uh, some amount of wheat or rice then you have to find somebody who is willing to 
to uh, to exchange for the good that uh, you are interested so it has become really difficult then here the store of value in the sense that if you keep your money or hold the money certain period it is going to give you extra value so that is it is also the unit of account the prices are expressed in money terms not in the commodity terms so under barter system when we used to deal with there you had the coincidence of wants the double coincidence of wants those things which means that if i am selling the wheat right and and i for by selling wheat i want a carrot so somebody should be selling the carrot then only i can exchange from wheat otherwise it is not possible so during earlier days when people had a limited knowledge about the usage of money they were relying more of the physical transaction so physical transaction since the carrying cost became difficult so money facilitated those kind of transactions in a big way and that's what we always mention about then here you have the store of value you can think about the time value of money right if you hold if you are keeping your money uh, in your bank account for certain period of time you may be rewarded a unit of account that it be, it has become really really easy but with the development of technology or advancement in technology it has become much easier to transact and even the transfer uh, money from one place to another second thing is that you have different alternative forms of money which means that i can use check i can use debit card i can use credit card so credit card has become a major source of alternative payments but with credit card you have the advantage and disadvantage the advantage is that it gives you immediate uh, flexibility to buy anything and then you can repay back after some period so maybe the bank will be giving giving you 20 days or 25 days of the free interest period so if you are transacting today you are supposed to pay by the 20th of that month if you are not paying then the interest rate will be accrued by the by the uh, by the bank or financial institution what is the cost with the bank the cost with the bank is that they provide the services of credit card at some fixed price so uh, sub fixed price you can say a b c whatever is the fixed price now with this fixed price why they are charging this fixed price because they also have to invest in certain infrastructure for maintaining the history of the, the consumer or also keeping record so in case of default this record will be used by the uh, by the uh, bank to monitor the uh, progress of certain transactions so for the bank also it incurs some cost but if you think about the usage then usage fee or user fee it gives the extra money to run the business and remain uh, liquid into the business and how and the, this is how banks operate so in so different types of measures of money we have so this is for the case of us where we have the fisher relation so here we have r is equal to r minus i which means that real interest rate is nothing but the nominal interest rate minus inflation so this is what we have the real interest rate uh, i will be talking more in terms of indian case that how we have so in case of m1 in india you have these kind of monetary aggregates in india so here you have m1 which is narrow money narrow money in the sense that it is just about the currency public demand deposits and it doesn't have any multiplier effect so the moment it, uh, it doesn't consist of any multiplier effect that we call it as the uh, in terms of liquidity it, it is very high easy to transact but there is no multiplier effect as such because it is just the money held with the bank broad money is having multiplier effect but because it includes the narrow money plus the time deposits of public with banks fixed deposits recurring deposits if you have recur if you have recurring deposits with the bank then this also gives the flexibility to the bank that they will keep certain amount and then they can lend it to someone else so you have something called credit creation so the term that we attach often with the money supply or the or the banking system is called credit creation where if you are depositing 100 rupees in a bank then out of this 100 rupees as per the requirement of the central bank banks will be keeping aside some amount of money and rest of the money they will be using it for uh, for a lending and with that they create extra money by charging higher interest rate so in credit market imperfections we have already understood about that how what is the role of limited commitment and and further you have the collateral 
M2 is also called the high powered money and this high powered money is basically dealing with the monetary base that how much you can simply lend it and how much you have you can use it for the 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 credit creation framework and how much it can be expanded. M4 so in the most of the government reports if you are reading the economic survey or any document you will be mention, you will be seeing that they will be mentioning about narrow money and the broad money. Here M4 it includes the total post office deposits except holding of the government bond what we call it as the national saving certificate. It also has the durations of 7 to 8 years, earlier it used to be 6 years, now it is I think 8 years and it also offers you a coupon rate. So, at the time of maturity you will have principal plus whatever is the coupon rate attached. So, that you get, but it, it includes the the deposits, the total post office deposits. So here it is M4. So here you have M3 plus uh, plus whatever money that you save in the economy. Now I'll be starting with this uh, in the next class, and I'll be giving you the some background that here in this particular model, when I talk about the monetary intertemporal model as such, in this particular model we are trying to understand that how we can create a scenario in which a representative agent who is rational and who has well defined preference about money, he holds a cash and credit card. So, in the intentable set setup, if he has been given the scenario that if the price, if the rate of interest is going to be higher, whether he should be using credit card or cash. If the rate of interest is higher, then it is highly likely that the, the this representative uh, consumer will be using more of credit card, less of cash because then this money that he has, he can lend it to somebody whatever is the rate of interest he gets back and then after paying the amount as long as the benefit that he is driving from the credit card, uh, it is or the if it is higher than the rate of interest or the interest earnings I would say let us think about the interest earnings. So, if the rate of interest is higher which means that this representative agent is going to get more interest income and this will create extra cushion for this particular person to use more of credit card. So, as long as the earnings is higher you do not mind using credit card. So, I will be explaining further details about this in next session and we will have the uh, further uh, explanation of this particular model with certain comparative statistics in the next session about the uh, uh, monetary intertemporal model and then we will be also looking at certain characteristics of the conventional and non-conventional monetary policy. I am stopping it here. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much.